welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Tonight we have a, 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 we're just two weeks off from Thanksgiving. Is it two weeks? Or one week? Oh, good. We got two more. We have two weeks. And I was looking at the platform, Give Thanks, and so tonight I'm teaching on giving thanks. Yeah. Thanksgiving can change your life is really the title of the message. And I came out from there because I was thinking I'm having a wardrobe malfunction here. So if my blouse starts going all the way over or something, it's just because I'm not comfortable. But that's all right. That's what happens when you're 63. And I got this for my birthday from my husband. So such a guy. Such a guy. And that was my son that was up here before. So if you're new, I'm the mom. Now I'm the nana. And Jim and I started the church 25 years ago. And now our kids are all grown up. And this generation's all grown up. And I don't know when we got old because we didn't see it coming, did we? <laughs> now we really can't see. Yeah. <laughs> but so since I'm the mom, I thought it'd be good for me to, to, to talk about Thanksgiving tonight because we're all coming into the holidays. How many are just excited about the holidays? <laughs> How many of you are just going, oh, could it just come and go? Yeah. Yeah, there are some of you like that. That's okay. And I just thought I'd maybe I'd open up tonight. I need to open up in prayer because I need prayer tonight really a lot. But um, before I do, I just thought I'd open up and I'd try a little joke. So you want to hear a joke? I usually blow these. So I'm going to try. So maybe I'll read it. But I have to put my glasses on now. So here we go. The day before Thanksgiving, an elderly man in Phoenix called his son in New York and said to him, oh, darn it, I just ruined it. I told you it was a joke. I shouldn't have done that. It's not a joke. It's a story. It's an illustration. Okay. Darn it. Darn it. Okay, let's start all over. Swoop, wipe the slate clean. Okay. The day before Thanksgiving, an elderly man in Phoenix called his son in New York, and he said to him, I hate to ruin your day, but I have to tell you that your mother and I are divorcing. After 45 years of misery, I've had enough. We are sick of each other, and so you call your sister in Chicago and you tell her. And he hung up. Well, frantic, the son called his sister, who exploded on the phone, and she says, oh, no. No, like, heck, they're getting divorced. She really said, there's not a snowball's chance in hell they're getting divorced. Now, that's not a swear word, because hell is a real place. <clears throat> She shouted, I'll take care of this. She called Phoenix immediately, and she said to her father, you are not getting divorced. Don't do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my brother back, and we'll both be there tomorrow. Do you hear me, Dad? You are not getting divorced. You've been married 45 years. You and Mom don't do a thing. We'll be there tomorrow. And she hangs up the phone. The man hangs up the phone and he turns to his wife and he says, okay, honey, the kids are coming for Thanksgiving and they're paying for their own tickets. <laughs> so here we are at the, hey, you guys did good. Thank you, you encouraged me about jokes. Thank you. It's Thanksgiving. And we have put on this platform to be in front of you for this last 30 days for the next couple of weeks to give thanks. And the scripture is give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And so tonight I want to talk about cultivating a grateful heart and the fact that Thanksgiving can change our lives. And when I started to just look into this subject, I was absolutely amazed at how much there is on it. And we could teach on this for several weeks on just the topic and the subject of thanksgiving, what it means, and cultivating grateful hearts. But since you've got to go home tonight and you've got kids to take care of, and so do I, and we all have to go to work tomorrow, I'm only going to do this in 30 minutes. So this is, a, this is just a sampling from the Word of God about what God has to say about us giving thanks. And so I thought I'd ask myself some questions, and maybe they'd be questions that you'd be asking. And one of them is, well, what does it mean to give thanks? I mean, what is the definition of Thanksgiving. And it means to actually, to give thanks in the Webster's Dictionary means to be grateful for something and to voice it. To be grateful for something and to voice it. So it's actually a declaration 
of your grateful heart, that you are grateful for something that has happened and you voice that sentiment. And looking at the word of God in the Old Testament, in second or in Psalms chapter 50, verse 12, and let me put my glasses on. I'm sorry, I'm not going to go there. Well, let's go there. Psalm 50, 12, God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you, deliver you and you will glorify me. So here the psalmist is writing in the second person and then he talks, what, he talks to God and then God begins to speak and he says, if I were hungry, what I tell you? I own everything, I've made everything, I am not here to have you give me sacrifices to feed me because I suddenly had a hunger pain. God says, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. What I want you to do is I want you to offer up your sacrifice or thanksgiving and pay your vows to me. In other words, thanksgiving in the Old Testament was a sacrifice and it was a vow to God. Let's go on to the, to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, and this is what God says here. Therefore, by him, speaking of Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. In the Old Testament, he says, pay your vows of thanksgiving. In the New Testament, he says, offer up a sacrifice of praise. In other words, I want my people to begin to understand that when they open their mouths and they begin to offer up praise and blessing and grateful hearts and they begin to thank me for something that they've received, that it's going to actually start something rolling in their lives. Because first of all, God didn't need the bulls and the goats. He wasn't hungry. And if he was, he wouldn't tell us. And God is not egocentric. He doesn't need me to stroke him because he needs to feel good about being God. Something happens when I praise God. Something happens in my life when I begin to switch over from not being thankful to being grateful and to voice my thanksgiving. And this is where I want to go tonight because we're living in a very natural world and in this natural world it is very ungrateful and negative negative. and in the natural bent of humanity we have a tendency to see what's wrong and not what's right can i get a witness in this house it takes a concentrated effort for you and i to begin to switch over from what we used to be in our old natures to what god wants us to be with our new natures and so this is something that is learned and that we can cultivate. So thanksgiving means to be grateful for something and voice it. What is a grateful heart and what does it look like? Well, like I said, thanksgiving is to voice being grateful, gratitude, a feeling of being thankful for somebody or for something that someone is doing. So gratitude accompanies thanksgiving like wet with water. This is water, and the characteristic of this water is if I put my hand in it right now, it's going to get wet, right? Can you separate wet from water? You're going to get wet if you get around water. Well, if you are grateful and you have a grateful heart, the characteristic that goes with that is called gratitude. It's just, it's just going to accompany it. It's the wet with the water. It's the gratitude with the thanksgiving. There's a reason why you're thankful. And... There are some things that happen, and I just, because of the time, there's many, many things that benefit us when we give thanks. But I want to look at two tonight, and then I'm going to look at how, three things on how to cultivate a grateful heart. So why does God want me thankful? Like I said, he's not egocentric. He doesn't need his ego stra stroked. He's not hungry. He didn't need me to bring sacrifices of bulls and goats. Why does God want me to learn how to give thanks and to be grateful? Well, two things. Number one... When I cultivate or when I begin to take on a thankful heart and a grateful heart, it causes me to magnify God. What does that mean? It means grateful hearts magnify God. Well, so grateful hearts magnify God. Well, let's look at the scripture. This is what happens and what benefits us when we give thanks. All right, grateful hearts magnify God. That's benefit number one. What in the world does that mean and why do I care? Psalm 69, verse 30. 
It says, I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bull, which has horns and hooves. Now, this actually accompanies Psalm 50 that says, if I, if I wanted to eat, I wouldn't tell you, and I don't need your sacrifice of bulls and goats. But God says here through the psalmist, I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Well, if grateful hearts magnify God, when I begin to thank God, when I begin to have a grateful heart of gratitude towards God, all of a sudden God is magnified. What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because when you magnify something, it gets bigger. Right? Now, there's two ways to magnify in our world. I mean, there's probably more, but the two main ways, as I was thinking about this, is the telescope and the microscope, right? The telescope, by definition, means to increase the apparent size of something. A telescope is a device for making distant objects appear nearer and larger by means of compound lenses or concave mirrors, whatever that means. But let's look at the Hubble telescope. It has the ability with its lenses to look into deep space and to bring back to us in magnification, things that are so far away from us that it brings the galaxies and the star systems close to us. And we are able to see these magnificent things that God has created. Is that not true? It, it causes us to wonder. Now, a microscope is something that does the opposite. A microscope can take something very, very small, so infinitesimally small that you cannot see it with the natural eye, like a bacteria or a cell, and it puts it underneath this microscope, and the lens there makes something small get bigger. So a telescope makes something far away get nearer, and a microscope makes something small get much bigger, right? So if I'm going to magnify God, then I've got a choice of either living my life with the lens of a telescope, making God near and big, or living my life with a microscope, making my trouble and the evil that's in this world so big that it becomes bigger than this magnificent God that has created me, has breathed out the universe, and has everything under control. Are you with me? The psalmist said, magnify God with thanksgiving. When you begin to thank him, it takes that which was so far away from you. And when trouble comes, God can seem far away. When all of a sudden, instead of getting good, you're getting bad. When you're believing God for something and the opposite is happening. When trouble shows up and Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. That tells me that if... Thanksgiving and gratitude is going to change my life. It's going to cause me to have a telescopic vision. And instead of seeing God as small and the trouble big, I'm going to see God as massive and big. And the bigger he is on the inside of me, the smaller the trouble gets. Are you understanding this? What this really is is a switch in perspective. You see, I'm going to have to understand that when I magnify and give thanks to God, that it's magnifying in me the size that God is. That I'm not looking at the trouble under a microscope, and it's starting to look really big, and it's going to take me out. But now I'm looking at the telescope, and I'm seeing this amazing God who's bigger than any giant, who's greater than any trouble, who says he'll never leave me or forsake me, who's given me all things that pertain to life and godliness, who loved me so much that he couldn't live without me, who came to this planet, fused with humanity, became a man, and he has redeemed me, he's reconciled me, he is restoring me, and trouble may be coming my way, but guess what? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, and my God's bigger than any giant on this planet that wants to take me out. So I guess I could say to you, you can live life looking under a microscope, or we can live life looking through a telescope. God can get near, or trouble can get big. So my question to you is, are you living by the microscope, or are you living by the telescope? And God says, when you begin to give thanks, you begin to magnify me. And out comes that spiritual telescope. 
And what was so far away now all of a sudden gets really close. Where the enemy's breathing down my neck. Where disappointment wants to come into my life. Where discouragement wants to overwhelm me. All of a sudden now as I begin to lift my voice and praise the name of my God and give thanks for what he's done, whether I see it or I don't see it, I am now taking out the Holy Ghost telescope and I'm looking at how big God is, how close he is, and how infinitesimally small that little germ bit of devil is. And he is nothing in my life. You know, we see this with Caleb and Joshua with the children of Israel when they were taking out the giants. Twelve people went out. Ten came back and said, the giants are in the land. They're bigger than we are, and we can't do it. And two, Joshua and Caleb says, they're bread for us. We can take them out. If God is with us, they'll be our breakfast. Caleb and Joshua went to the promised land. The other ten and all the children of Israel that followed them died off in the wilderness. See, the devil wants you and I to live under a microscope of trouble. He wants you to see that your trouble is so big and God is so small that there's no hope. And the actual opposite of that is true. And God says, when you begin to praise me, you begin to magnify me. You begin to make me bigger. And the bigger that God begins to get in my spirit, then guess what? I become a giant killer. Suddenly giants are now just little spots under a microscope. Now the giants are just nothing more than training for me and taking out trouble. That's all they are. Caleb said they're breakfast for us. So what do you believe in God for? What is it in your heart? What do you want from God? And what has God told you you could have? You see, it all begins with a grateful heart and thanksgiving because when you pull out the praise, all of a sudden you pull out the Holy Ghost telescope and you are now seeing what can't be seen. And God is now the giant in your life and the giants are now nothing more than just a little bit of German dirt. So what happens when I cultivate a grateful heart? Well, God is magnified my perspective changes how about this grateful hearts shine the light of the dark God's called us to be a city on a hill the book of Revelation Jesus is seen tending the flame of his church he's got a candlestick in his hand it's holding seven candlesticks seven churches you see you are the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ on this planet you're part of him. He's the head. We are the body. If he's the light, we are the light, and we're to shine the light in the midst of the darkness. Now, what does the enemy want to do? He wants to put out the light. He wants to absolutely cause me to get so distracted with everything else that the light doesn't shine. But in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, let's look at the scripture for this. Paul writes to the church, and he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Paul says, listen, I'm not here, but now you need to work this out. You need to flesh out this salvation that you've been given. Because God's working in you. He's working in you his will, and then he's working in you the power to do it. That's called grace. God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. God's working his will in my life, and then he gives me the grace to come alongside and get it done. He doesn't just tell me to do something and doesn't give me the power to do it. He gives me the grace, the power, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on our behalf, and we can't do it. God gives us grace to do his will as he works his will in us. And then he goes on and he says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Verse 14, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We shine as lights in the world. So when I'm complaining, when I'm sour, when I'm depressed, when I'm just not a happy girl, when life is tough, when I walk around like I'm sucking on lemons, I am not a sinner magnet. There is nobody coming to the light when my light is dull like that. And that is exactly what the enemy wants us to do. He wants us to be dull. He wants us to have no brilliance. 
He wants us to absolutely be ordinary, everyday losers. And that is such a lie. And God says, when you begin to praise me and cultivate a grateful heart, now you shine as lights in the darkness. You know, have you ever been with somebody and they're just happy? They just like themselves and they like you. They actually enjoy life. They actually, actually, actually cause you to want to be with them. Have you ever been with somebody that's going through some trouble? And they don't mean to, but that's all they can talk about. They vent, and it's day in and day out, and you see them, and you know, oh, this is what we're going to hear, because they're still going through it. You know what I'm talking about? And after a while, you love them with all your heart, but you kind of avoid them. Why? Because you've got enough trouble of your own. You don't want to hear theirs. Right? Is that a magnet for you to want to be with them? No. You want to ditch them, don't you? See? Shame on you. No. <laughs> of course we do. We're human. But God is saying, if you'll just begin to magnify me, I'll get bigger on the inside of you. So you've got the telescope out and you can see how big I really am, how little trouble really is. And when you begin to praise me and give thanks to me and you do all things without grumbling or complaining, you shine as lights. Now, the case in point, and we've gone to this many, many times, and I'm not going to turn there. I'll just reiterate the story, just a quick memory for you. Paul and Silas, when they were in prison, they had their backs broken. They had done a good thing. They cast out a demon out of a, a young woman. They got beat up for it, thrown in jail. They did good and evil came. And all of a sudden, they're in stocks and they're in prison and they're singing at midnight. And then they have to go through this massive earthquake, right? It's like, really, God? You don't think that was probably scary? If you were in stocks and you couldn't move and there was a huge earthquake, so much that it was shaking everything down, do you think you would have the opportunity to be afraid? You can't even protect your head. And there they are in stocks, and this massive earthquake is happening. They're praying and singing, and then the jailer comes, and he's about to kill himself. And they say, no, no, don't kill yourself. We're all here. We're not going anywhere. And the jailer gets saved and all his family, and there's a revival. they are lights as they're singing in the dark. What is God saying? Christianity offers what this world cannot find. It offers the joy of God, the goodness of God. It offers, you know, we ought to be happy, effervescent people. Life is really good in Jesus, and if life isn't good right now, hold on, it will get better, and the best is yet to come, because this place and where we're at is a very temporary assignment, but God says, I need you to understand that when you praise me, I get bigger, therefore you become a giant killer, change your perspective until you become lights that shine, and you bear fruit, and when you bear fruit, your life is fulfilled, I'm happy, you're happy, everybody prospers, hello, so... Having said that, let's just look at three things tonight to cultivate a grateful heart. You all right with me? This is a simple little message, but just a reminder. Number, I'm just going to give you three things because I've already given you two things, and I thought, well, two and three, that's five, and then, you know, the joke and everything. And okay, well, let's just do this. <laughs> three things. How do I get a grateful heart? How do I get in the habit of being grateful and not a complainer? Okay, number one. I'm going to have to learn it's a learned process to be content in the state that I find myself. Hmm. That made everybody real happy. <laughs> that means when nothing changes. That means when you believe in God and you are between the amen and the hallelujah. You know, the amen is God, I believe it. I pray for it. I believe it's going to happen. And the hallelujah is when it happens. But between the hallelujah... And the amen is called life, and it's the journey of faith. And it can take a long time, or it can take a short time. God doesn't really fill us in on how long it's going to take. Have you noticed that? Remember when he gave Joseph that wonderful vision about being a leader? And his parents were bowing down to him. His brothers were bowing down to him. And everybody was bowing down to him as the leader, Joseph, you know, the baby son. God did not tell him about the slavery. He didn't tell him about the betrayal. He neglected to fill him in on Potiphar's wife. He didn't tell him about, you know, the prophecies in the prison and he'd be forgotten for another three years. He neglected to tell him about the Egyptian prison 
So when Joseph got the dreams, he said, oh, yeah, amen, I believe it. To the hallelujah was a long trip. It was a very long trip. And in that trip of faith, God says, you child, me, Debbie Cobre, I'm going to have to learn to be content in the situation I'm in. It doesn't say you have to be content with yourself, the way you are, you want to change. But it means that in the meantime, between the amen and the hallelujah, and that's up to God when the hallelujah shows up. And it may not show up earth time, it may show up heaven time. I don't know, that's beyond me, because he's sovereign. But between the amen and the hallelujah, there is a place and a, and, a, and, a, and a way of life. It's called contentment. It's called being at peace and being satisfied, not losing your joy and not losing your hope. Because you know that even though you don't see it, you know that God is faithful, God has said it, and that it's going to happen, and he's going to give you the grace and me the grace to walk this walk through the situations that we don't like and through the situations that we do like. Now, look at what Paul said, Philippians. I know these are common scriptures, but let's just, this, you know, it's really where we live. This is where we live. I'm going to read this in the Message Bible, and I forgot to tell Adam to put it up in the Message Bible, so let me just read it to you. Paul says in the Message Bible, I'm glad in God. Far happier than you would ever guess. Happy that you're again showing such strong concern for me. Not that you'll ever quit praying and thinking about me. You just had no chance to show it. Actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I have found the recipe for being happy whether I'm full or whether I'm hungry, whether my hands are full or my hands are empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. Now let's read it in the New King James and we'll put it up on the board. Paul says, not that I speak in, disre in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things. Not some places and in some things, but he says everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry. I love that. I have learned. I have read this in the last 25 years of being a pastor's wife and a pastor here at this church. I have learned. That has brought me great comfort because I realize it's a learning process. It's a learning process to be content in the situation that you're in. When you get a bad report, when your kid has cancer and you're believing God for that child to be saved and that child to be rescued and delivered out of that, and you're still in the hospital and you're still going through all the, all the things that you have to go through to save that child's life. Is there a place where I can actually be content in that, God? Is there a place where I can actually be at peace? Is there a place where my heart can actually be at rest? Is there a place where I can lay my head down at night and I'm not afraid and I'm not worried? Yes, there is. When you've lost your home and you don't have a job and there's no hope of one and you're so discouraged that you've kind of run out of energy. Is there a place... For you, where you can have hope again and where you can believe God when your bills actually can be paid. When somebody's left you or run off of, with somebody else. When your relationships have gone sour. When life happens, church, because life happens. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not so good. And we love to talk about the good, but what about the not so good? Because that's where a lot of us live a lot of, a lot of times. And God is saying it's when it's not so good. It's when your hands are empty. It's when the report comes and it's not changing. It's when your faith is out there, but your faith seems to be not moving any mountains. You can learn to be content. You can be full or you can be hungry, but content means you can be satisfied and full of peace, whatever situation you're in. How can we do this, God? Because Paul said, I learned the secret. It's a secret. It's a secret place, guys. It's a secret. It's a mystery. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And now, you know, sometimes I think we preach this so much and we hear it, but when we really have to come down to the everyday living of it, let me read it in the Message Bible one more time. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy whether full or hungry, my hands full or my hands empty, whatever I have, wherever I am. I could make it through anything 
in the one who makes me who I am. In the one. Church, one of the greatest lies that the enemy has spawned in our lives is that Jesus is up there and we're down here. And that there's a separation. There is no separation. You are joined to him. You are seated with him in heavenly places. And he's right here with you on this planet. The Holy Spirit never leaves you, and he never forsakes you. He walks with you 24-7. And for me to begin to develop a grateful heart and be content in the situation, I have to consciously switch my mind off of the trouble, get out of the microscope, and I've got to begin to make an effort because this is learned it's learned. It's not something you get out of bed one day and boom, you're a happy Christian and everything's fine and you're a perky little boy or you're a perky little girl and you are just Pollyanna's brother or sister. That doesn't happen. You got to make yourself do this. You got to understand that there's a power behind this. That when you magnify God, God gets bigger on the inside of you and the giant that is trying to stop the promises of God from coming into your life is now becoming the size that giant is supposed to be, which is minuscule and bread for you. And the bigger God gets, the stronger you get, the greater faith you have. And God says, one of the things about this, the key ingredient to this is contentment. You're not chasing dreams. You're not chasing this. You're not chasing that. Your joy and your happiness is not based on outward appearances or structures. It is based Based on the fact that you belong to me and I belong to you, Jesus said. Listen to this. Historian observes our inflated expectations. I gotta hurry. Historian Daniel Burstein suggests that Americans suffer from the all too extravagant expectations. In his much quoted book, The Image, Burstein makes this observation of Americans We expect anything and everything, we expect the contradictory and the impossible. We expect compact cars, which are spacious. Luxurious cars, which are economical. We expect to be rich and charitable, powerful and merciful, active and reflective, kind and competitive. We expect to eat and stay thin, to be constantly on the move and ever more neighborly, to go to a church of our choice, yet feel its guiding power over us. Ooh. Go to a church of our choice and yet have the ability to feel its guiding power over us, to revere God and to be God. Never have people been more the masters of their environment, yet never has a people felt more deceived and disappointed. For never has a people expected so much more than the world could offer. Content. What are we chasing? What are we running after? There's an old saying that says, I had no shoes and I complained until I met a man who had no feet. If you're not content, things aren't where they need to be in your life, do a heart check. Lord, where am I falling short? Where am I missing it? Are we chasing things we shouldn't be chasing? Are we impatient? Is the hardships of the journey between the amen and the hallelujah wearing us down? That's why God says, magnify me, because when you magnify me, I get bigger in you. When I'm bigger in you, you're stronger than you could ever be on your own. So if I'm going to cultivate a grateful heart, I'm going to have to learn to be content. Number two, I'm going to have to voice my thanksgiving, not my complaining. Voice my thanksgiving, not my complaining. Morning, noon, and night. Scripture. Psalm 92, verse 1 and 2. A song for the Sabbath day. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. To declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. That psalmist, that song says, get out of bed and begin to praise God and thank him and be grateful. When you go to bed at night before your head hits the pillow, thank him and be grateful. In the middle of the day, like Daniel, stop. Daniel thanked God and prayed six times a day. Six times a day. Sometimes I sit down and I don't even thank God for my food because I'm so busy. 
or I've gotten in a bad habit. You see, these are habits, kids. These are habits that we cultivate. And God is saying, you need to cultivate some new habits because it'll change your life. So God hears my grumbling and my complaining. He does. He listens to it. Do you know what the definition, Webster's definition for grumble is? Mm, this is good. To make complaining remarks or noises under one's breath. To murmur or to mutter in discontent. To complain sullenly. So if I'm going to voice my thanksgiving, I'm going to have to change what I say. It's a conscious effort. So that means I'm going to have to remember where I've come from and what God has taken me from and taken me out of. That will help me change what I say. It means that I'm going to have to watch who I do life with because if I'm around people that are constantly complaining and constantly negative, that mixed multitude can rub off on me. And instead of being grateful and thankful and happy, now I'm sour and I see the worst and I see what's wrong and not what's right. Do you understand this? And God says, listen, I'm listening to you. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 4, this is what it says. Now the mixed multitude who were among them, the children of Israel, the mixed multitude were people that weren't Jewish. They were the disenfranchised of Egypt. And when all the plagues came in and everything else, they decided to side with Israel and they left with Israel. They were mixed. They were a multitude. They weren't the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were from other nations in Egypt, and they followed them. And this mixed multitude, it says, the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. They couldn't handle it. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. Now they were cooking in their sleep. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. It ticked off God really big time because manna was angel food. And the mixed multitude, who they were hanging out with, leavened them. And they complained about a perfect resource that God had given them. And God says, you're going to have to learn to voice your thanksgiving, not your complaining. Why? Because God's listening to us. He listens to our words. He writes them down. Jesus said that every word that man has spoken is going to be recorded. We're going to give an account for it. Watch this, Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 in the Amplified. Then those who feared the Lord talked often one to another, and the Lord listened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who revered or reverenced and worshipfully feared the Lord and who thought on his name. Verse 17. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I publicly recognize and openly declare them to be my jewels, my special possession, my peculiar treasure. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And then you shall return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him who serves God and him who does not serve him. God is addressing Israel through the book of Malachi. And he's saying, you're complaining. And you're saying, it doesn't pay to serve God. Why, the sinner gets more blessed than we do. And God heard it. And he says, listen. I'm listening, and I'm writing it down. And those of you that worshipfully fear me and reverence me and talk among yourselves about my great deeds and about me, I'm writing it down. And when the day of wrath comes, when the trouble comes, you're going to be like an only son who is spared in the day of trouble. Now, I have an only son. His name is Luke Cobray. There was trouble coming. He carries the Cobray name. Is he important to us? You better believe it. He's an only son. You don't think you're that important to God? When trouble comes, he'll spare you as an only son. When we begin to voice grateful hearts and thanksgiving. Man, if you're going to gossip, gossip Jesus. If you're going to say something, tell all the wonderful things Jesus has done. If people get sick of it, and you know, people tell me I'm Isaiah's sister. I'm the prophet. I'm always preaching. I'm always doing this. Well, you know what? Oh, well, it's just going to get a whole lot more as I get older because I don't know what else to talk about because when I talk about the other crap, nothing happens except I get depressed and I see what's wrong and not right. But I begin to lift up my voice and I begin to speak, thus saith the Lord, and I begin to tell of the wondrous things that God has done and who God is and what he's doing and what is happening. All of a sudden, the giant starts to come up in me. 
God is magnified in me. I get stronger. I switch from fear to faith, from doubt to belief, from selfishness to sacrifice. And suddenly, my life begins to change. So, how do I cultivate a grateful heart? I'm going to have to learn to be content. I'm going to have to learn to voice my thanksgiving. Watch who I hang out with and watch what you say. And this is the last one, and I'll quit with this because I'm over time. It's that joke. It took so much time. Number three, remember why we're here. Remember where we're going. Listen, this is Thanksgiving. It was started by pilgrims, sojourners. They took their kids because of persecution from England to Holland. And there in Holland, their children were learning Dutch and they didn't want to stay there. So they went back to England. They got on that Mayflower and they came to Plymouth. And they started this country. And they started it as pilgrims with thanksgiving. And this is what God says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Speaking of Abraham and Sarah and the Hebrews of faith that have all gone before us. Some of them got what they were believing for. Some of them didn't get it this side of, this side of heaven. But this is what God says about them. These all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. We're assured of them embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. We are strangers and we are pilgrims on this planet. We are in this world, but beloved, we are no longer of it. We've been born of the Spirit of God. We have been brought back into relationship and fellowship with God the Father. Your spirit has been fused with the Holy Spirit and you are reborn with a new nature, the nature of God. The kingdom of heaven is coming to you and coming to me, and God has given it to us so that he can work it through us. But if we don't remember why we're here and where we're going, we can get tripped up along the way. We can lose our focus. We can lose our passion. And we can lose our direction. This Thanksgiving, God is saying to his children, his strangers and his pilgrims on this planet, and it started in this nation over 400 years ago. Remember why you're here and remember where you're going. This is a temporary assignment. It's a vapor. It'll be over before you know it. And then face to face with eternity and the one who loves you, who is here for you, who will not leave you or forsake you, who will walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death because that's all death is, is a shadow. It's a valley that you're going through. You don't stay there. Who has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Who promises that you will have a roof over your head and food. And if you don't, then there'll be somebody that'll bring you in and give you that. Because the stuff that we have in America is not where life and joy and peace come from. What comes from life, joy, and peace is the one who has made us, who has given himself for us, who has purchased us, and who loves us and will never let go of us and bring us safely home because we are strangers and we are pilgrims on this planet. And this is a temporary assignment, beloved. So this Thanksgiving, let's make it count. Let's open our mouths. Let's declare his faithfulness. Let's declare his praise. Let's be lights that shine. And let's let God be big on the inside of us. So those silly giants on the outside that are roaring and ranting can become breakfast. Amen. Amen. You know, I've just preached the gospel to you. The gospel means good news. That's what it means. That's what gospel means is good news. Behold, I bring you tidings of great joy. The angel said to the shepherds, 
which will be into all the earth. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. You see, God knew that you and I needed a Savior. He knew that we couldn't save ourselves. He knew the ravages of hell. He knows the darkness that you and I can't even see. And so God came, became a man, born in that manger, grew up and paid the price for my sin and your sin, went to Calvary's cross, and he says, if you will look to that cross and if you will believe that he is who he says he is, the Son of God, the Son of Man, and you believe in him, you will have everlasting life. You can't save yourself. He's already done that. But you, can, you have to, and I had to, receive the truth and say yes to it. If you have never said yes to Jesus Christ, no matter how good you've tried to be or how much you've gone to church, what you were raised in, what kind of faith your family might have brought you up in. This all goes back to one thing, and it's Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. What have you done with him? Have you looked at the cross? Have you believed? And have you said yes to him? Be my Savior and be my Lord. Because if you've never done that, then, beloved, you're not saved. You're not born again. You're still in darkness. But you're here tonight, and you're here for a reason. And God brought you here tonight to save you to the uttermost. He didn't make you for hell. He made you for heaven. So all over this auditorium, this Thanksgiving season, you're here tonight. If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've been messing up, oh, listen, God knows about mess-ups. You're looking at one of the biggest mess-ups in this church. Many, many years ago when I was a young woman, God wasn't shocked over my sin. He wasn't mad over my foolishness. He just knew that I couldn't save myself. And he said, come home that's you tonight. I'm talking to you. If you've been a very, very good person, better than I'll ever dream of being, that wouldn't take much. But you've never looked at that cross, and you've never said yes to Jesus Christ. I believe that you are God's son. I believe that you are God's savior, and I need a savior, and will you be my Lord? If you've never done that, and that's why you're here. Because God's knocking on the door of your heart tonight and saying, come home. You're my son, you're my daughter, but there's only one way to me. It's not through your good works. It's not through your human effort. It's through my son, Jesus Christ. And the only way there is through faith. I just believe and I say yes. He's already done the work. So all over this auditorium, you need to get right with God. I'm talking to you. I'm going to do something that might make you a little bit uncomfortable. I'm going to ask you if you need to get right with God. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. We'll do it all together in just a minute. You say, well, I'm going to feel funny. Well, too bad. You'd feel a whole lot funnier if you were in hell and you couldn't get out. You'd do anything to get out of hell. Why can't we raise our hands in a safe place? I remember walking an aisle when I was 13 years old, scared. It was Billy Graham crusade, my goodness. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If I can't say Jesus is my Lord and my Savior in a safe place, how can I walk outside in a hostile world and live for him? This is real. This is what it's all about. We do a lot of funerals as well as we see a lot of births. There's appointed once for man to die and then judgment. There's no other way to heaven. What have you done with Jesus? Let's get right with God tonight all over this auditorium. I'm just going to count to three, and I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand. Are you ready? One, two, three. Just lift your hand and let me see your hand. Lift it high so I can see it. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Lift him high. Be proud of this because he died for you. Say yes to him tonight. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Oh, I need my glasses on because I really am very blurry. I see that hand. I see that hand. Let's do this. Stand. Let's all stand. You raised your hand tonight, or if you didn't, and you should have. I just want you to grab what you brought to church with you, and I just want you to slip out of the aisles, and let's meet me right here. Let's get right with God before we receive offering tonight, before we do anything else. I want to get you right with God. I can't save you, but he can. I'm just the messenger tonight inviting you to Jesus and saying, here, come and meet the man that's going to change your eternity. So quickly come. Just quickly come. If you didn't raise your hand, ah. Eh, it's not too late. Just get out of your seat and just come. Amazing love. Just 
quickly come. I'm going to ask that you not leave right now. That would be counterproductive to what the Holy Spirit's doing. We've only been in church an hour. Just quickly come, quickly come, quickly come. Amazing love. Quickly come. I know it's true. It's my joy to Just quickly come home. He's so not mad at you. I think there were more hands that went up, but I'm not going to make you come. I'm not going to twist your arm. We're not here to manipulate you to salvation. That'd be crazy. All I can say is, why would you not want him? The one that gave everything for you. Why would you not want the one who made you and loves you and is the only one that can fix you? I'm just going to give you one more moment. You know, you can just scurry, get down here. Anybody else? Okay. Hi. Smile. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday party. It's yours. Well done. This is Pastor Joel. He's going to take you off into a room that's private. We're going to pray with you, and we're going to give you a book that my husband wrote, talk to you about a few things, and then we'll send you right back out here. But we want to do this and take our time with you. So if you could just make a whatever this direction is. <laughs> Lovely. It's beautiful. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.